13 metres penalty for about the fourth time in this match. This is it then for me. This is it for Cork as well, however. Slocum outside towards John O'Driscoll. It's going to be a free. Time will miss that. They live on the edge of their seats. Cork, beaten by Meade in 1967. Beaten by Meade in 1987. Beaten after a replay in 1988. Are the 14 men to prevail in front of their loyal band of fans. The subs wait. The double has been achieved. It's Cork's All Ireland. It's Cork's year. The double in hurling and the double in football. In 1890, it was two club sides, but now a county selection has achieved this remarkable feat. Cork's first victory in the All Ireland over Meath and the county's sixth victory in all. The day and the month of September belongs to the red and white. The Sun Maguire has been retained by the champions. Yeah, the year, of course, is 1990, and those are the sounds from the All-Ireland football final between Meath and Cork. Cork doing the double. They, of course, had won the hurling a few weeks previous. It is our focus this morning for the Classic Game Club. This is the show where we go back and watch old matches. It's like a book club, except for classic games. This week, Tommy Rooney and Nathan Murphy have been watching back that classic between Meath and Cork. Uh, Nathan, as the... Resident spokesperson for the 1990s year, to put it that way. Do you remember this game at all? <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking you two lads, I presume, weren't even born No, uh, when this happened. Uh, no, and uh, watching it back last night, it's it's like watching a different sport. Part of me was watching it going, this is the worst game of Gaelic football <laughs> I have ever seen. And then I'm just trying to recalibrate my head that actually it just doesn't feel like the Gaelic football that we watch now in any way. Mm. Like... Like the brilliance of it is the toughness of it and obviously the rivalry of uh, Cork and Meath and Cork going for that first ever double and the sheer strength of some of the men on the pitch. But it, it's like, I don't remember once during the game a halfback getting the ball and making a rampaging run forward. Every time a halfback got the ball, it was, I'm going <laughs> to kick this as far forward as I possibly can. Like This is a final that took place, what, two months after Italia 90? Yeah. And it's Jack Charlton style football <laughs> is get it forward as quickly as you possibly can. Paul McGrath and Mick McCarthy on the pitch, of course, for Cork as well. The, the Italian <laughs> 90s references can go on and on. I noticed that as well. It's just, there's a lot of hoofing going on in this game. It is the most manly man's game, potentially, in the history of Gaelic football. I, I think it's probably peak manliness, peak tough guy. The, the couple of things that I noticed, first of all, everybody in this game looks like they are 38 years old. They all look really unbelievably old. There is um, uh, a time when the camera pans to Stephen O'Brien, and I'm like, uh, this guy is clearly a grizzled veteran. He clearly has about 10 kids. And then the commentator is like, Stephen O'Brien, of course, under 21 next year again. And I'm like, how, does all, how do all these kids look like they're 40 <laughs> years old? They all look like they've been through the wars. They've seen some things that none of us should see. They're, they're all well beyond their years. Everybody is a tough guy. And you do not want to get caught in the crossfire of Meade versus Cork in 1990. That's what living through the 80s does to you, I guess. It's true. Tough time. Like there's, there's many, uh, part, like Connor Cunahan's hair is a revelation mm. uh, throughout the game. Yeah, they, they do all, like the very fact Mick Lines is on the pitch just gives it an extra a level of manliness. Oh, without question. We'll get, we'll get into Mick Lines in a moment because he takes a haymaker and just brushes it off as if it's nothing. Just to give uh, the context uh, for this game, like as you mentioned there, and it was mentioned in the commentary there as well, a more than familiar rivalry at this point, late 80s into the early 90s, Meath versus Cork. So they'd met in the 1987 final, Meath had won that game. Met in the 1988 final, Meath had won that game. At this point, Cork had never actually beaten Meath in the All-Ireland Football Championship, but they had beaten Mayo to win the 1989 All-Ireland final. So they're going for a double-double of sorts, because as we've mentioned, they've beaten Galway in the hurling a few weeks previous and were All-Ireland football champions. And to make it sweeter, they now have a crack at Meath to get revenge for 87 and 88 in the 1990 decider. So this is 100 years on since their only other double. So there's a kind of a nice symmetry to that 80-90, the last time they did it. I was looking into this as to whether or not Cork are the only county to ever do the double, they're not. Can you guess, Nathan, the other county to have done it? I'm going to say 
Tipperary. Oh, great shout. Yeah, correct. Got it in one. Tipperary, your uh, 19th century GA knowledge knows no bounds. Ah, just don't ask me to name the year. <laughs> 1923. <laughs> I think it's something around then. I uh, didn't even jot that down here. Uh, just to go through uh, the teams in the day and... Just to clarify, each and every one of these is a hard bastard, I think it's fair to say. So the Cork team, you John Kerrans in goal, you have a, a full back line of Tony Nation, Niall Cahalan, the beast that is Niall Cahalan, uh, and Stephen O'Brien as a full back line. Michael Slocum, Connor Coonahan, and Barry Coffey as their half backs, while Shea Fahey and Danny Cullity, like a hard hitting midfield there, uh, they're eight and nine for Cork on the day. Dave Barry, Captain Larry Tompkins, and Teddy McCarthy is the half forward line. Teddy McCarthy, of course, the only man to have started the hurling, who's also involved in this football team. Paul McGrath and Mick McCarthy, as I've already mentioned, either side of Colm O'Neill in the full forward line. Mead then, their goalkeeper was Donald Smith. They have a full back line of Robbie O'Malley, Mick Lyons, and Terry Ferguson. A half back line of Brendan Riley, Kevin Foley, and Martin O'Connell. Liam Hayes and Jerry McEntee in midfield. Like that is. That is the battle to end all battles. Shea Fahey and Danny Cullity against Liam Hayes and Jerry McEntee. Fantastic uh, lineup of midfielders there. You had a half forward line then of David Beggy, PJ Gillick, and Colin Brady. And then a star studded full forward line for me. Captain Colin O'Rourke, Brian Stafford, a full forward, and Bernard Flynn, a corner forward. Like, you look at those two teams, Nathan, and I think if you're kind of comparing icons versus icons, that me team definitely edges it in terms of more high profile names. Yeah, well, that mead full forward line is as good as it gets. And maybe actually the entire game hung on the fact that Colm O'Rourke wasn't fully fit for the match. But yeah, it, again, it's just tough, tough men, every single one of them. Uh, like the, the context, uh, looking at the game, actually, one of the first things that stood out was uh, how cold it seemed to be. How cold? Jerry McIntyre looked absolutely frozen at the throw in. <laughs> I did not know like he was. It looked like he was shivering. Maybe he was just scared. <laughs> maybe maybe he knew the battle was to come I did like the fact actually from a uh, purely media if you knew Johnny McEntee that... lads you'd know that Johnny McEntee wasn't scared oh, I'll tell Tommy, you that much Tommy Rooney <laughs> how are you doing come on in hiya fellas how are you we're, we were just saying here that this me team on paper far more star started than Cork and it's an absolute disgrace that he didn't win this All-Ireland a disgrace that it didn't win this All-Ireland. So I, I have a good point to make on that when we get back to the sliding doors moment a little later on the Classic Game Club. Was it a disgrace? Look, if you look at the age profile, there was a good split in that mid-team. There's a lot of 20-year-olds, but there was a lot of lads that were quite old as well. Um, uh, I don't know. Do you know what? Do you know what it was a disgrace? The shooting on show that day was probably a disgrace. Brian Stafford is one of the best footballers in the country. Um, I watched it back last night. I couldn't believe the amount of freeze he missed in the second half. Some of the bad decisions that were made... Nathan mentioned that Colm O'Rourke wasn't fit. Like, I think that's the only reason Cork snuck this one by a couple of points. Yeah, and that is it. They did sneak this. It's a terrible game, Tommy. Terrible, but like... But is it, is it a, uh, is it a terrible like, sport? Is it, sorry, terrible is too strong, first of all. That's definitely hyperbole. Is it indicative of the sport at the time, or is this a bad game, even taking into the context of the early 90s? I, I, think, I think it's a bit of both. Um, when we said we were going to do this game now, a classic can be a classic for a number of reasons. It's not a classic because there's loads of goals. It's not a classic mm. because, you know, of the history around it as well. A classic can be a classic for any amount of reasons. And this one is a classic because if you heard, you mentioned earlier on the hardiness on show. This was a time when men were men. Nowadays, <laughs> what, what, does that what does that phrase mean? Footballers, footballers are footballers nowadays. And men were men back then. Those lads weren't really playing football a lot of the time. The amount of hoofs <laughs> up the pitch. Um, and I think uh, I know actually an intercounty coach who has recently done uh, a case study on Dublin Mead in 1991. He went back and he watched all four games. Um, and I'm going to try and get it on paper and bring it to air the uh, the learnings that he found from that Dublin Mead um, saga and how it, the quality just wasn't there. Like so, like when you're looking at some players on show, like clearly, like when Colin O'Neill broke through and smashed the ball off that crossbar. There isn't many footballers nowadays that do that. But like, Brian Stafford's first point in that game, he, he strokes over loved above the outside of his point. There wasn't really much kicking like that. Bernard Flynn is a stylish footballer. But apart from that, there were, there were boots, just big old hoofs. Couldn't be wearing Doc Martens to put them over the bar. I disagree with you fundamentally on the lack, really? of, on the lack of stylish footballers. I think that this was indicative of the way footballers were instructed to play at that time. Like, you mentioned Conor Cunningham's stylish hair, Nathan. But look at the style of the footballer. Like, the utter grace that that man carried, Liam Hayes, the grace that he carried, just, like, okay. floating, floating above the turf. 
Oh, and just a good example on Cunahan there. There's a great moment in the second half towards the end where he says two brilliant dummies, and then he fists the ball away. But that doesn't doesn't happen nowadays. <laughs> like, yeah, you might you might say rope, Gaelic football is robotic now, but that was a ten yard hand pass, and it just goes completely astray. I don't know whether the quality. Maybe it was cold, as Nathan said. I, I, looking back in photos, I thought you said men were men, Tommy. What? I thought you said men were men. The cold shouldn't be affecting how these men play the game. If you were saying that this was uh, an incredibly masculine time for Gaelic football. Well, it was, uh, do you not think it was a masculine time? The hits that went down in that game were absolutely outrageous. They were, and they were fair. One question I want to ask before uh, we get into some of the categories here. Who would you run through a brick wall for, for first? Billy Morgan or Sean Boylan? Hmm. Sean Boylan. That suit he wore was unbelievable as well. Talk about style. Yeah, Boylan. Boylan every day of the week. Sean Boylan looks like he's uh, Jordan Belfort about to get onto his yacht in the Wolf of Wall Street. Like, he absolutely... Uh, flo- uh, like, God, he's got the, that style down, the, the shirt and the slacks. Billy Morgan, though, and the tracksuit, there's something a bit more terrifying about that. Like, I, I do love the, the sight of the two men sort of talking to their teams before throwing as if this is some sort of very calm, composed speech. And I'm sure what they're saying is said in a very calm and composed speech. But what they're clearly saying to their team is you need to go out there and absolutely murder your opponent. And that is mm. what... That, 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 that is Sean Boyle in a nutshell there, you know. Uh, an unbelievably nice uh, man and then his team would be sent out there to kill th- their opponent. But actually, does that really happen throughout this, except for the very obvious punch that happens? Was this not a, quite a clean game? Uh, th- th- there's a, what about all the slide tackles? Like, what 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 happened to that, that tackling technique that seemed to be prevalent back then, where you led with the feet first? That happened time and time again. Uh, I think it was a. It felt like a clean game because players, very much in contrast to now, took their punishment of a free. It, it was very very rare that a player complained. Like there was a respect for referees. It seemed uh, back then that so like, constantly in the first ten minutes it was free after free after free. But it just happened quickly. The player who gave away the free acknowledged he hit his man late. Move on. Whereas now mm. every single free is a surrounding the referee and it feels like it's a dirtier game. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Um, we may take that point and go straight into moment of the match here. So uh, for anybody who's just joined us in the Classic Game Club, we've got a lot of different categories that we go through throughout uh, the duration of the podcast. Moment of the match is where we tend to start. And I'm going to lead this off by mentioning Colm O'Neill boxing the head off Mick Lyons. And boxing the head off McLeans doesn't do McLeans justice here because what happens is Colm O'Neill is done, what is it for, picking the ball off the ground? Mm. Or, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's some innocuous, <laughs> it's some innocuous foul. Ly- like, Lions come <laughs> through the back of him. Like, Lions fouls him. Like. Yeah, and, but like, it's a, it's a free out. It's a bad call by the referee who is Paddy Russell, by the way. Like, me, Tommy, Meath people must love Paddy Russell. He, he essentially they got... absolutely he, do not love Paddy Russell. Paddy, I had a couple of people Russell. text me last night saying Paddy Russell... Ruined them in that game. Now, I wasn't sure looking back if that was the case, but Mead fans who'd watched it back in the 90s were telling me Paddy Russell ruined them about that day. Paddy Russell is the man who advised Pat McNenny to send, to send Lee McHale off. Let's not forget. Mead people yeah, must absolutely you know, love this referee. We're talking about 1990 here. We're not talking about 1996. It's all, it's all the one decade. Anyway, back to uh, Colm O'Neill. So Colm O'Neill gets a, a straight red card. After picking the ball off the ground, he's a little bit annoyed. So he just goes in with the inside of the fist, straight to the head of Mick Lyons who barely flinches and is like, all right, I just got boxed in the head with a left hook there by a fairly big man, carries on with his business. As you say, people are actually just uh, able to get on with it and Colm O'Neill gets a red card. For me, that is the summation of this game. The level of hardness you needed to have within you to even get an entry pass into one of these teams at the time. Yeah, I think um, that was my moment of the match as well because when you look at it first, it looks as though from the initial camera angle, as though Colm O'Neill almost just flicks at him. But then you see a couple more angles, and he gives him a good thump. It's a and dunt. Lines, it's a dunt, lads. That's a dunt. Kinda, he just kind of brushes it off. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I, I, Mick Lyons is probably as shocked as anybody else that Colm O'Neill was sent off. <laughs> no, he was worried not. for his lads, own future. No, Mick Lyons was not shocked that Colm O'Neill punched. Don't give him a dunt in the face. <laughs> if you watch it back frame by frame, the free gets given. Okay. O'Neill doesn't whinge to the referee, but he kind of holds on to the ball. If you pause it there, Mick Lyons has the tongue out. He looks like that emoji who's about to pull a fast one. And he goes in and he gives O'Neill a bit of a dunt to the shoulder and he knows he's going to get a reaction. He gets punched in the face and he's delighted. There was nothing better than getting punched in the face back then. Red card. <laughs> there is- can, I just, can I just mention my moment of the match? And it happened yeah. about three frames after that. It's, it's the walk 
from Mick Lyons after that as he's walking away and that iconic number three jersey just shining in gold and his collar how his collar is just ruffled the way it is he honestly I couldn't make my mind up last night should he be replacing Pierce Brosnan as James Bond or should he be a Bond villain he was one or the other and that's my moment of the match James Bond for me definitely definitely more of a, a Bond man uh, this is mentioned by Charlie Mulgrew in the aftermath of the game, Charlie Mulgrew there with his uh, notebook on the Sunday game is his unique side. But he's talking about that as well, that this is all a Mick Lyons master plan to get mm. Tom O'Neill sent off. I, th I think we're giving him too much credit there, Tommy. No, you're not. You're talking about the, the greatest full-back uh, that has existed, apart from Darren Fay. He may... He may... He, <laughs> 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 he may... I love this mead bias. Uh, he made the best draw of uh, any footballer of the 90s, but I'm, I'm not giving him credit for actually wanting to wind Colin O'Neill up so that he would test his own jaw. 100%. 100%. That's what he's doing. Like, or else he's he thinking O'Neill's just going to take it like a man because men were men back then and he didn't take it like a man. If, if you wanted to go for a different moment in this match, the John Kerrin save in the second half would have to be up there in terms of an important moment of actual football that occurred. It's I, I can't even remember who gets the shot away, Tommy. I can't, I can't remember. Colm O'Rourke. I think it's Colm O'Rourke. Is it O'Rourke who gets the, the shot away in the end? Um, or is it Beggy, no? But, um, anyway, it Beggy? It's, I, it's one of the It's one of the full forward line. It's either O'Rourke or Stafford who gets the shot away. But it comes from this unbelievable run from Liam Hayes. And this is like 40 minutes into the game. We haven't seen anything from Hayes. He's getting castigated at halftime in the analysis. Like we've seen loads of McEntee. We've seen loads of the two Cork midfielders. And then the fourth midfielder on the pitch, Liam Hayes, has been anonymous. And then all of a sudden he decides, right, mm. I'm going to show you all why I'm so highly rated. Just slaloms through about 20 Cork players and sets up the opportunity for Beggy, who should bury it. And at that point, that's back at the net. 15 men against 14, Meath win the All-Ireland. But John Kerrins pulls off this unbelievable save, which apparently, now I haven't watched the 1990 Hurling final back, is similar to a Jer Cullingham save that is made in the Hurling final. And these two moments uh, they are very symmetrical, that there is these two Cork goalkeepers winning the double for the county. For me, in terms of the competitive direction of the game, John Kerrins doesn't make that save, Meath score that goal, Cork do not win the double in 1990. It, it was a key moment. It was a massive moment. And um, it, it, it was actually the three man weave is a drill that every club footballer in the country can now take a break from for the next however long we're out of this. But um, it was a perfect three man weave as well because Kevin Foley was going off his left shoulder and he was open. So he could have slipped it to Foley inside. And of course, Foley's the man who puts the ball in the back of the net against Dublin the following year. So maybe that's history there, a sliding doors moment there. Slip it to your left and it's in the back of the net, and that's the All Ireland for Mead in 1990. Potentially. Potentially you might be onto something there. Um, let's talk about the halftime show. Nathan, what are your takeaways from this? Oh, sorry. This is this is the moment of the match. I think it the, probably is. The, 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 sorry, the entire halftime was... I was, when I was watching it back, about to start flicking through and I thought there was something wrong with the YouTube page as I kept flicking past this Cadbury's <laughs> ad that even though I was fast-forwarding, was still on. The Cadbury's ad, they must have, this must have been Super Bowl levels of expenditure from Cadbury's in 1990. The ad must go on for three minutes. It has to and be. And nothing happens during it. It's just, it's just so oh, slow, no. sensual. It's salivating. It's, it's, I, wanted, I wanted a dairy milk more than I ever wanted one in my life last night. It's, it's unbelievable. It's an erotic chocolate ad. Mm. In yes. the middle of an All-Ireland final, it goes on for a good two minutes. Like, this is the 1990s, guys. This is, this is like, we're a very kind of... Um, a conservative country at this point. This is not suitable for young eyes, this uh, Cadbury's ad, and uh, how long it goes on for. There's a lot of people who've seen things they've never seen before when they see that uh, Cadbury's ad at halftime. There was a hell of a lot of dairy in that ad break as well. A lot of dairy, a lot of milk. That was quite enjoyable, and then there's an ad for flora. I don't know whether we can call it butter or we call it uh, spread. I don't know what it is. Um, spread. What, what, what else spread. happens in the, the halftime show, Nathan? Uh, well, very little analysis, for starters. Uh, so Martin Carney's there, obviously, uh, as chief analyst, I presume, at that stage. Who was alongside him again? Charlie Mulgrew. Uh, Char Charlie, Mulgr Charlie Mulgrew was there, and uh, Charlie Mulgrew uh, literally looks like he was walking past the studio and they decided to, uh, Charlie, come in here for five minutes. We hear, very <laughs> little from, we, we hear very little from either of them because we're sitting watching Declan Nurney mm. for a good seven or eight minutes. I presumed when they came back that they would show the first 30 seconds and then they might have the music in the background. But no... We got the full Declan Nurney experience, and he was loving it. You can forget J-Lo, as far as I'm concerned. Forget Shakira. It is all about Declan Nurney if you want a good halftime show. They pulled out all the stops for him. They have the current Artane Boys band, the 1991, and then the past Artane Boys band as well. They brought out two different Artane bands 
to satisfy uh, the musical needs of Declan Nerney at this point. It is big show band stuff in the middle of Crow Park and he is wearing the most outrageous outfit you will ever see in all the colours of the rainbow on his tie. I don't know, it looks like, it looks like Sergeant Pepper or something in the middle of the Crow Park pitch. <laughs> Um, quite, quite, why, why don't we have this anymore? Why, why has the halftime pageantry been taken away from the GEA? No, I think uh, maybe not the last couple of years, but they did have bands come on at halftime and play an old song. But like, know, that's because you've like been Crow Park for All Ireland finals recently, Nathan. People on TV don't get to see that. Oof. That's true. So should RT should be broadcasting me? Like, they, like this is. For me, this is the start of something great where it's like Declan and Ernie and this big band and uh, everybody waving their flags uh, at halftime for the GEA to turn around and say, how can we do this again? How can we go bigger and better over these next few years? Not that you can get any that's, bigger and better than Declan and Ernie, that is. That's, that's the thing, though. Like, the GEA 30 years ago, the GEA was potentially more futuristic than it is today. Like, what's the first thing Jerry Canning says in that YouTube commentary? Welcome to our British viewers on Channel 4. I didn't realise that. I didn't know that mm. the, the All Ireland Final was broadcast on Channel 4 back in the day. Is that... Did everyone know that? Did you know that? No. No, I did, no. Uh, no, I didn't. And, yeah, like, that's that, that's something that stuck out to me as well. This, this seems something that is so perfectly of its time. If you told me, draw a sketch of the 1990 All-Ireland Football Final, I would probably draw exactly that. It is perfect in terms of the flags, in terms of the colours, in terms of the specific advertising that has been done around the stadium. It is just so perfectly 1990 and of its time. But you're right, there is like a, a GEA kind of leaning towards a more futuristic element. There is kind of inklings of a new Ireland. I know afterwards you have Larry Tompkins giving a shout out to everybody from San Francisco to London that there is still a huge diaspora of Irish people. Emigration is still a thing. And there are Cork people all over the world watching this thing that there is Ireland at a crossroads here getting used to erotic chocolate ads at halftime big uh, musical acts at halftime of a game and uber commercialism in certain areas as well it's an, it's an interesting was, snapshot of Irish life there was, a, there was also a moment before half time I don't know whether you could pick it up in the commentary and I'm not going to say the word but we all know the chant that was directed towards the referee and I presume it was the Cork fans because Colin O'Neill had just been sent off well you could also the hear referees, the referees uh, yeah, the, the, uh -oh. the, the, yeah. the referee's a wanker. You could, you could hear oh. the, uh, the Cork accent uh, through the chant. It was like Cork people singing in unison. The Cork go on, give it, give, it, give it a go. Well, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, it's, what is it, 9.14 in the morning, it's grand. So I can't really do a Cork accent. The referee's a wanker. But I, I can't do a Cork accent. I, like, I can't say a Cork accent. I can't sing a Cork accent. But that was what Jesus, we was everyone's, everyone's self-isolated at home this morning. Nobody's <laughs> yeah, in school. Yeah. <laughs> you've never had more people watching you and that's what you have to come up with you know I'm pretty proud of that um, well hey what about the size of the men back then they were huge what are, look, Joe Castle's come on the field for Jerry McEntee to start the second half and I've never seen a man so big <laughs> he is gigantic I was like who the hell is this man like, he is... but even even the, the they co we're constantly putting up the weights of the players every time yes yeah. <laughs> I was like, that made me feel like, better about myself six, six foot two, 14 stone 7 yeah. yeah, welcome. welcome I was like, bloody hell, I could have made it back then. And Jer Jerry McEntee is 6'2", 12 stone. Like, there is a varying degrees of weights amongst people of similar heights here. Uh, there's also, like, a, a big fella that comes on for Cork with a big knee brace. And I'm pretty sure there's nothing wrong with his knee. He's just trying to take the piss <laughs> out of uh, Colm O'Rourke <laughs> by wearing a knee brace. Like, there, like, there's tons of things that come... Like, your man, Castles, who comes on, it's, it's like one of those kids' Disney movies where two kids stand on top of each other and put a big overcoat on it. I was pretty sure there was two human beings inside the Cork jersey at that point, uh, for, or inside the me jersey at that point. Um, right, let's move on to uh, Secret Man of the Match. The actual man of the match was uh, Shea Fahey. Damn it. Yeah, you've probably gone for him. Yeah. I had to, oh, I had to Fahey, do a bit of looking into this. But Fahey, I think, is the man who actually did get given man of the match that night uh, on the Sunday game. Um, I'm going to just kick this off, and I'm going to nominate Larry Tompkins because of the fact that one thing has never changed in Gaelic football, and that is the free taker, when it comes to it, in the business end of Gaelic football, will be your most important man on the pitch. And Larry Tompkins in my view, is the most important man on the pitch on this occasion, just because of some of his unerring ability to put the ball over the bar at certain times, escaping the attention of multiple people time and time again, and kicked two points after doing his cruciate in this game. So he said this a few years later, my knee took a wobble and my cruciate severed, but I hopped up quick, afraid Dr. Khan would come in and take me off. It was like someone had shot you, the pain was unreal, but then it went and I just blanked it out of my head. If I was going to die, I was going to die there. He did his cruciate, he kicked two points. There is no way he is not the man of the match, in my eyes, in this game, Larry Tompkins. 
Yeah, I think uh, you can go along with that, particularly considering in the first half how poor the score taking was. Mm. I, there was a surprise. Larry Tompkins didn't take the first free. They give, give it to Cullum O'Neill and put it wide, and he looked absolutely deflated. It was a battle day for Cullum O'Neill. He hit the crossfire as well in the first half. Mm. Uh, it just didn't happen for him. But yeah, Tompkins, in such a tight game, in such a terrible game of football, your free taker is always going to be absolutely crucial. And yeah, it's hard to disagree. For me, lads, uh, Dave Barry was my mm. secret man of the match. He uh, went about his business uh, quietly, but he was absolutely everywhere. He actually, I didn't realise that. I thought Sean Boyner maybe brought it in a couple of years later, the, the wing forwards that would drop deep and, and be everywhere. But um, he played a role like Brian Dewar or uh, Paul Gavin would have played in the 2000s. He was absolutely exceptional. And uh, I actually enjoyed following him, kind of bouncing off shoulders the way you would in, like, um, what's the name of the bumper cars? Like That's what the shoulders are like back then. You'd bump off one man onto another, and Dave Barry was just doing that the whole time. So he was my secret man of the match. The tackling was good. Can we say that? I thought there were some good interceptions. Like, I see your eyebrows are raised, Tommy, uh, well, about this. I, I thought it was quality, like, as you say, like bumper cars, good, clean shoulders quite a bit. I have uh, written down here six tackles that would be banned in rugby in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go on, go shoot uh, them. Do you have them? Do you have the six that, tackles or what, what were they like? I, they I, were I, like I there was them. like a shoulder to the head. There was a, uh, there was close, there was close lines. Um, there was just lads getting nailed left, right and centre and they just got up and got on with it. My, I really did enjoy the bumper car element of the shoulders though. There was one moment, I think I, uh, I put it up on Twitter accidentally, uh, a three second video of a, a mead man fielding a ball between three cork lads and just bouncing between all three of them. Like it was just, it was comical, but it was brilliant. Um, Paul McGrath and Danny Pulley need a shout out, shout out for uh, man of the match here as well. I thought they were excellent. You got like you're not giving Tony McIntyre any love here, Tommy? Was he not one of the, the best? Jerry, players? Jerry, McEntee. Jerry, Jerry McEntee, uh, Sorry, Jer Jerry McIntyre. Like Jerry McIntyre started that game with the manic aggression that I could only aspire to have on a football pitch. It was absolutely unbelievable. I don't know whether he ran out of steam. I actually, I actually put it out there. Was this peak Jerry McIntyre? asking the question because I wasn't sure if it was or not but he got taken off at half time I'm not sure if there's an injury or as Nathan said maybe he was a bit cold and I know Jerry he wasn't cold but um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the issue was but he started it really well but as we said Shea Fahey was the actual man of the match Hayes had a quiet game Fahey ran the show um, in terms of uh, off the ball um, qualities Jerry McIntyre though was 10 out of 10 yeah he was he was pretty good I just have a note here lads because I, I feel like I said earlier on that the quality wasn't as good, and I don't think I backed it up um, when I said it. But it was just a moment that summed it up for me towards the end of the game. It was after Cairns had saved, and Mead were chasing the goal. And uh, Colin O'Rourke hoofs it from uh, around 45 over towards the sideline, and it goes over Colin Coyle's head, over his shoulders. Coyle receives it, turns his man, and hoofs it back over towards the square. Now, you can tell from the way that Coyle has hooked the ball from the sideline that the ball is going nowhere near the square. It ends up about 25 yards from the goal and in a cork man's hand. But Jer Canning says, very good-looking ball as the ball leaves Colin Coyle's boot. <laughs> and if that's the standard that they were judging at back in 1990, and if that's what was good and a good-looking ball, well, then I think we have to say that the quality is slightly improved these days. And you have the likes of Michael Murphy and Paul Flynn kicking the ball the way that they do. C Canning does lose his shit entirely as well when somebody uh, completes a 20-metre kick pass yeah. at, at one stage. And it's like, uh, like actually picking out a man and kicking the ball to him is just not something that you do in Gaelic football. Speed trumps everything. Oh, there was there was no picking out a man at any stage. Like Mick Lyons, uh, very early does what great fullback does, and he rises up inside the square and he collects the ball. And you're thinking nowadays a fullback would just look to his side and hand pass out, and you try and build from deep. He gives it the most almighty welly. He kicks it from pretty much his own goal line to up on the halfway line, and that was his job. Like, but gives it straight to a court player. But it doesn't matter because he's got rid of it. Um, do you know? Do you know? It actually, lads. The game actually gave me more of an understanding of the lads that we know. And I'm not going to say my old fella does the same, but he's been guilty of shouting it before. Let it in. He's been guilty of shouting yeah. that on the sideline quite a bit. And there's plenty of other men around the country and women around the country who are guilty of saying let it in as quick as you can. I can understand why they wanted to let it in because it worked back then. Because it was a bit like hurling, let's say. Now 
I might get in trouble in the office if I said this. I'm gonna. I'm in the sanctity of an empty fifth floor here in Marconi House. But yeah, no, yeah, you can definitely. It's a bit it. like skill levels and hurling right now. You just hit it as far as you can to the corner and let the lads work away at it. That's what it was like. Let's clip that. Tommy Rooney <laughs> says modern day hurling is as uh, unrequiring of skill as 1990s football is. Thank you for that soundbite, Tommy Rooney. Let's We're going to need to... soundbites, lads, up in the next few weeks. Let, here. Let's uh, roll on to trending, the trends that we noticed from 1990. There are loads here. I will, I'll leave you to it, Nathan, if you want to kick this off. Ah, well, the amount of kicking was uh, the obvious trend uh, in the game. Um, freeze, for the first time, I think they were saying you could kick freeze from the hand. It was just recently brought in. For but some again, freeze. Even still, even there were loads of freeze been taken off the ground from like deep inside their own half. But again, it just fed into the hoof it forward as far as you could. Like there was no, if you had a free inside your own half, you weren't trying to work something. You were just trying to kick it as deep as you could mm. into the opposition half. Uh, one of the things, maybe it's not the trending, is how bad Meath were in that first half. They were absolutely brutal. They had a one five or six minute spell, but but for a team that you like reflect on has been a, as a as a great team who'd won a couple of All Ireland titles, like they were shockingly bad. Uh, Colm O'Rourke, just like thirty three at that stage, knee not right, but you could just see the flickers of genius from time to time from him. It, like, I think we're probably all in agreement if he was fit, it's a it's a different result. Yeah, but like I don't buy the whole fitness thing for Colm O'Rourke this day. Like his issue was his radar. Like he won uh, a few good balls, and he he had two shocking wides in the game, Tommy. I'm sure I'm sure even you'll agree. With that. Did you see the noise, the the size of the knee brace on? Mm. Gin ginormous. Obviously, that's going to knock off the radar, like. Okay, maybe it will, maybe it will. But I I just don't see how you can actually be as involved as he is in the game because he does get a good few touches on one leg. And if you like, you're suggesting it was that bad. If you can't kick the ball over the bar, then you can't really run and get the ball, unless the man who is marking him, unless Niall Cahalan. Well, maybe not Callan is quite slow, but uh, like I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think that that was perhaps a little bit overplayed. Um, the, uh, the other trend I would take uh, from this morning is that Tommy Rooney can't talk about Mead football without going into full-on Mead accent. I've never heard him speak <laughs> like this before. That actually, I actually didn't realise that it happened, but uh, it happens to me every time I go home. Well. Tommy, what, what other trends do you have? Hi. Hi. Is that uh, how you do it? My know, trend, but... lads. My trend, uh, look, quickly, slight tackles. I'm not saying to bring them back, but it was refreshing to see them. Um, but <laughs> the other trend I have, and it's a difficult one to to explain, it's it's the juxtaposition of styles that were on show. Like nowadays, people turn up in the same tracksuits. They wear the same gear. You know, fair, various players are sponsored, but most of them all look, players look fairly similar nowadays. Do you know what I mean? But back then, you had... As you said earlier on, Billy Morgan in his tracksuit, Sean Boyle in his white suit. You had um, Mick Lyons looking like James Bond compared to Niall Cahalan, who looked like he would just have to come out of a bush. Um, <laughs> Bernard, Bernard Flynn. Bernard Flynn. I, I have a lot more a lot more um, uh, of an understanding of how good a footballer Bernard Flynn was after watching this. And Bernard Flynn was a stylish corner forward. He was a pin-up corner forward back in the 1990s. Like Bernard Finn, but, but Bernard his style, Finn looks better his now than he his did grace. Back then. <laughs> he actually, he actually does. He actually does. One man I had never seen before. I actually don't think I've ever seen Martin Carney before until I saw him in half time. I've only ever listened to him. Really? Sorry, yeah, mean, I was like, I was right like who is that? Who, who is in the studio with Charlie McGrew? I didn't know that Charlie what? that uh, Martin Carney looked like that. <laughs> How is that possible? You've like, never he's... seen Martin Carney before. <laughs> I don't think. Well, maybe it's because it's thirty years ago. He just looks completely different. But he doesn't. I actually... just didn't realize that that was what Martin Carney looked like back in the... Like Michael Lester doesn't look any different, really. Like. Ah, he don't... Michael Lester is a handsome bastard in the year nineteen ninety. Yeah, I'm saying he doesn't look any different nowadays. But True. Martin Carney, I, I, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have known him. Anyways, That's the juxtaposition right. of styles. Colin Coyle's Under Armour. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether it was the Under Armour skins. back then or it was just a big pair of boxers, but like they were blue. Why were you wearing blue Under Armour with a green jersey? You don't do that. Because you're everyone knows you don't do that. You've got to, you know, match up the colours here. Some players did it, some players didn't. So that was my thing. The juxtaposition of styles, and it was pretty refreshing to see that everyone was their own man. Back when men were men. I think the evolution of shorts in the GEA has gone on like a little bit of a curve where like they started off in the very old grainy footage where they're quite low and then they reach kind of a peak where they get unbelievably short and then they've come back to being lowish now. That peak where they're at their shortest is at this very game, 1990 All Ireland Football Final, Mead against Cork. There's one fella, I think it's the Mead centre back, who is wearing his jersey tucked out 
and you Kevin can't even Foley. see his shorts. Yeah. You can't even see his shorts because they're so short. That is what the trend uh, is. Short shorts yeah. are absolutely all the rage. That I, like Colin Coyle is obviously uh, astonished by how short the shorts were, and that's why he put on his blue skins and the their shorts. So uh, that's what I took from trending. Uh, in terms of uh, most jarring, we kind of mentioned these uh, a, a good bit already. Uh, no play acting, no malaise really at any point uh, in the game. A lot of hoofing, as we've said. Freeze off the ground, the flags, but like just the op- on the freeze off the ground, is the ball heavier? Because it looks heavier. It looks like a lot of them are struggling to get elevation on the ball. Or maybe, maybe... I had, uh, it, it, weirdly, I thought that they, they felt like they could hand pass it about twenty yards further than the current players can. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, you're giving them a get out of jail free card there because I think the shooting was just terrible. Can I make one point on that? The uh, kicking the freeze off the ground. Uh, because it was enforced a lot more players had to do it back then like nowadays you can be guaranteed that you might only have three players on a football team who kick a ball over the bar from 45 yards so you might actually if everyone was forced to kick the ball off the ground you might see a lot more players struggling to get it that far it's true yeah I, I just don't understand why there just wasn't better off the ground kicking when off the ground freeze were the thing at the time like you would have thought it just didn't I just thought that there was moments where the skill execution was fairly good I don't think power was an issue for these lads and just to see a lot of these off the ground frees just be completely completely fizzle out wide maybe the surface wasn't as good in Crow Park as well I, I don't know but it, it looked fine to me uh, so that's something kind of uh, stuck out to me um, we're going to move on then to, uh, kind of to, to our final section here to the sliding doors which kind of gets into the context of this I'm not I'm not sure what to, to make of this I'm not sure whether this is a huge triumph or not for Cork that they end up doing the double in 1990 and then the decade ends up becoming a year of huge turbulence in both codes. That surely if you're a Cork fan there in September 1990, you're like, right, this is going to be the year for Cork. And what, did they, they win a, a, another All-Ireland and either code before the end of the decade? Like this is, this is surely a, a nosedive in expectations from Cork from where they are at this moment. It's peak Corknesses at 1990. Well, I would have thought so, but like, is Pete mm. Corkness then not to step up and say, right, well, we're going to dominate both of these sports. We are, we, we're the big boys now, and we can do it in, in both codes. And then, is Pete Corkness not to put yourself in a position of uh, yep. greatness been just around the corner and then to self-sabotage? Yes, sorry, I see what you're saying. Of course it is, of course it is. Well, sorry, Pete Corkness yeah. would be being on the right side of arrogance. Of course, Corkness would never come into play with why they didn't win uh, another few All-Irelands. But like I, I don't know, like what what is what is the context of this game? Like is it like is it a situation where me like come back and like it takes them a while, Tommy? I think you'll admit for them to get back well, to this level again. Yeah, well, well look, I I did a bit of a, a study last night because I knew this question was going to come up because it's one of our topics, and uh, after a bit of kind of work with with mathematics and a bit of uh, equations and science, I'm obviously not using my words very well here. What the, the sliding doors moment, the result ultimately of Mead losing the 1990 All-Ireland football final to Cork is that they beat Mayo in 1996. And that would not have happened. Mayo would have their All-Ireland title if Cork had lost that day and Mead had won. Explain, explain yourself. Because it forced, it forced a transitional period in Mead football. We had an unbelievable minor team coming through. There was another 21 uh, medals won as well. And it forced Sean Boylan to push out the, the legends of the late 80s um, and the early 90s. And over the next couple of years, they were phased out. And by 1996, you had Tommy Dowd, you had Ollie Murphy, uh, you had New Blood, you had a lot of them now in, and um, Darren Fay. Like, a lot of those boys were in by that stage. And that is the only reason. Not Paddy Russell. Well, maybe he is Paddy Russell. Maybe if Paddy Russell had given me a few more frees that day and had beaten them in 1990, Mayo would have their All-Ireland. Well, uh, I'll uh, hand this over to you, Nathan. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think it's a bit much to associate the events of September 1990 with the outrageous cheating of the Meath team six years later. Like maybe cheating. the roots of it were in cheating. that match. It was a fight. Uh, it was a row. Yeah, instigated by the Meath players to try and get Mayo's best player sent off. Hold on a second. Owen's neutral, and he's done a documentary on it. Owen, was this cheating by Meath in 1996? I'd, I would say Mayo were very hard done by... Uh... No, thank you. But it's not cheating. Yeah. Cheating is a very specific word here, lads. Yeah, we've like you've made such a horrendous point. You've actually lost Nathan Murphy. His Skype line has gone down no, because you're you're, you're talking honestly, so much. It's not that people. bad a point. It's not that bad a point. That game, that mead losing forced transitional period in mead football, and it led to their dominance in '96 and '99, getting the three All Irelands in the following decade. Cork, as you said, they sat on their 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 history winning year, and they went into the doldrums for ten years. Mead won the All Ireland in 1996 because they were good enough to pick up one in what was a ragtag decade. 
everybody who was good enough won an All-Ireland in the 1990s in both codes. Apologies, by the way, to any Cork hurling fans out there. I forgot about the 1999 hurling final, which, of course, Cork managed to win. Absolute classic, 13 points to 12 against Kilkenny. Somehow that slipped my mind when I said that they'd uh, a fat out of the uh, case. So they did it. And Mead, Mead obviously bet Cork in the 99 and Ireland football final as well. There you go, actually, yeah. So um, that least he got back to finals in, in both codes throughout the decade. But I, I just think that... I don't know. Like I, I don't know what this game tells us about the decade as a whole, but what we do know is that the following 10 years were a bit weird. They were great, but they were weird. We saw the emergence of a number of Ulster counties as legitimate contenders for successive years after that. Changed the landscape entirely in terms of how the whole country viewed Ulster football. But then it's very telling when you look at that 1990 final that the first thing we all said about it was the hard edge. This was the All-Ireland final where we're like, right, this is a tough game. You'd want to be able to handle yourself going out into that pitch. And the one thing that the Ulster counties managed to do is handle themselves going out into that pitch. So I think what this tells us about football at this point is that what matters more than anything else is your attitude and your determination and your ability to show a bit of grit. And that is why Ulster counties were so successful over the course of the 90s. And it's probably also why nobody managed to go back to back because there was always a county beside you who was going to be more hungry to come back the following year and knock you off your perch. So like, that's my theory on what this whole thing represents. I think it's a snapshot of a great rivalry between Cork and me that's time, but the legacy yeah. of it is that toughness is going nowhere in Gaelic football. It is going to be everywhere for the, for the rest of the decade. And really, beyond that, when you look at how Tyrone and Armagh emerge in the, in the following decade. Mm. Yeah, it was the end of a, an unbelievable rivalry between Mead and Cork, I think, in 1990. Um, and as you said, I'm really looking forward to actually looking back at the Ulster, the Ulster All-Ireland wins over the next couple of years in the early 90s, because that down team were unbelievable to watch back then. I've seen one of the All-Ireland finals, the 91 one recently, and I'm looking forward to watching it back again. Let's go through the All-Ireland winners that year. Was it Down 91, Donegal 92, Derry 93? Did Down do it again in 94? Down again in I 94, yeah. And then you've got Dublin, Dublin Mead, Kerry, Galway, and Mead, Mead again. Like, that's, that was unbelievable how it was shared back then. I know it was known as revolution years in hurling. What was it in football? It wasn't, it obviously wasn't the devolution years, but like, what, what was it? <laughs> Well, well uh, I don't know, we'll come, we'll come up with some sort of fancy name for that. Who, who was the team of the decade of the of the 90s? D Downer Meads, if you're, if you're going by All-Ireland's one, it's got to be one of the two of them, doesn't it's it? It's going to be Meads, isn't it? Because be, they got well, the finals. And they kind of spread it across both sides of the decade. Down were only in the early 90s. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong about that. And Down had an unbelievable team in the late 90s and they were just unlucky. But there's no sign of any Ulster sides after 94. Oh, um right well, I suppose there's Tyrone in 95. Who did Kerry beat in 97? Mayo. He's not back, is he? Uh, he's not, no. Okay, uh, okay. I'd yeah. say his phone died. He's been on the phone for the last two hours co-hosting the show. We're going we're gonna to wrap up very shortly, but I completely agree with your point about if you're bookending a decade, then you're at a team of the decade. Just like, for example, if a team were to win the 2000 All-Ireland and say, I don't know, the 2009 All-Ireland, they are definitely the team of the 2000s. What team well, was the two All Ireland? That was a, oh, that was a Sorry. very different anyway, decade. That's uh, a, a debate that obviously has been well hammered on the show before. Over or underrated, Tommy, the 1990 All Ireland football final? Uh, completely underrated because when we said we were going to do this game, um, Kieran Shannon got back and David Sheehan got back to, in LFM, LMFM, and both lads warned me and said, You're not going to enjoy this one um, for the quality and show. And now, at times, I'm going to say, at times, the quality was putrid. At times, it was good. But the thing is, the excitement level maintained. Like, I watched this game last night at 10 o'clock. I should have been going to bed. It was actually on live on Air Sport at the same time as we, we watched on YouTube, completely randomly. I actually ended up watching the second half on Air Sport. I would watch it on YouTube just for the, the, uh, the halftime analysis alone. But as I said, the quality wasn't great. But the absolute excitement throughout, the hardiness, the history around it, I think this final is actually underrated. Well, I'm going to actually judge this on what the game was, and it's, it's overrated. Like, the game, the game is clearly overrated. When you, nobody, nobody rates it. Nobody thinks it's a good All-Ireland final. Uh, I definitely, I personally did. When, when you talk about Cork Mead, you're like, oh, great games of the, the late 80s. Actually, that's nonsense. They're not, they're not great games. It's not a great game. It's a great era. It's a great team. And there are great characters. And there's great toughness. And as an occasion, and... As an enjoy, I would actually say as an enjoyable experience, it's a little bit underrated. I didn't know that you could actually enjoy uh, a turgid affair as much as you possibly could, and maybe turgid is a bit strong. But I think as a contest, I think as an actual game, as a classic game, which is what we're here to rate, Tommy, I think it's overrated. I just, I just don't think, it, I just don't think it was very good. But at the okay. same time, there's such an enjoyable charm to it. Um, and when was uh, the last time you didn't 
fast forward a half time analysis when you had the chance. When was the last time I didn't? You couldn't forward? like you like you wouldn't be able to fast forward it. It was just it, it was, well, it was remarkable. The, I, I'm judging on the whole occasion. Okay, I know it's the classic game club. We're talking about the game. Are we going to give the game a rating? Yeah, give it give me a rating there. I'm going for a six. Uh, on the quality of the game. Yeah. Four. Four. Okay. So I've actually rated the game hard. Overall, overall eight quality four. Um, the reason why we didn't fast forward half time, Tommy, is because of Declan Ernie and the colourful mm. tie and the tunes absolutely bopping in the middle of uh, the field. Uh, is there any final thoughts, Tommy, before we wrap? Uh, I just really enjoy it. If anyone is at a loose end over the next couple of weeks, if anyone has a bit of spare time in their hands, you could do a lot worse than going back and watching the 1990 All Ireland final. And if you do that, get in touch. Let us know. Um, let us know what you think in terms of Secret Man of the Match or the trend and topics. I, I actually, I loved it seeing Dr. Khan appear in the field every so often. Um, I really enjoyed the shoulders, the punts, the hoofs, the shite solos. Um, it was good crack. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a good way to sum it. It's very, very good crack. Watch back yourself. It's all available on YouTube for anyone who hasn't seen the game. All the rest of our classic game club episodes as well, available on youtube.com forward slash off the ball right now. This is about episode seven, Tommy, I think. Uh, we're going to have yeah. another one for you tomorrow morning. It's going to be Celtic against Rangers from the year 2000, the 6-2 game for Celtic. That'll be your St. Patrick's Day classic game club tomorrow. If you've got any suggestions as well, tweet us at off the ball, tweet Tommy or I. If you want to get in touch with us personally about any classic games that you may have watched, that you may see on YouTube or in Daily Motion or somewhere online, and we'll watch them back and review them here in the Off the Ball studio. That is our lot this morning for OTV AM. Thanks for that, Tommy. Uh, Nathan, of course, uh, lost his battery there a little bit earlier on. We're back uh, tomorrow morning. Make sure to follow us at Off the Ball uh, to keep tuned to what we've got coming up tonight on the radio from 7 o'clock. Off the Ball will be live.